So I want to begin with a confession. I've been very fortunate in my life. I, have, uh, I had two parents who believed strongly in my education. I was able to go to college, go to graduate school, go to law school, and have a successful career. But none of it would have happened if I hadn't been able to attend in Wichita, Kansas, almost 50 years ago, it's hard to believe, uh, some great public schools. Now back then and today, many kids were not and are not so fortunate. They grow up under economic conditions that are much or were much, lever much less privileged than mine. I'll give you an example. It's taken from this terrific book by Harvard political scientist Robert Putnam, uh, Our Kids. Let me talk about two of those kids, Lola and Sophia. They lived in South Los Angeles, uh, an impoverished area, gang infested, to the point where their high school had to have a chain link fence around it to keep out the criminals. But unfortunately, as you can guess, chain link fences do not guarantee a good education inside. And so when Putnam's interviewers asked Lola about academics at the school, her answer was, what's academics? And her sister chimed in, you know, our teachers don't do much more than just babysit us at class. Now, do you think that kids that attend a school like Santa Ana, if they graduate, have much of a chance of realizing the American dream after they graduate or after they leave school? Of course not. Are there many more schools like Santa Ana in the United States? Unfortunately, the answer to this question is yes. Can we blame all these schools if a lot of the kids at them don't turn out so well? No, we can't because a lot of the kids that go to these schools come from broken homes and it'll be lucky if they get pushed to actually try to achieve academically. But is it possible or is it true that the schools could do better and serve these students despite all these handicaps and help them be better through life? And Putnam reports research that the answer to that question is yes, those schools could do better. But it's not just poor kids who are at a disadvantage in our educational system in, uh, in our country. If you look at international test scores of 15-year-olds and you look at average test scores for all students in the United States, you find that Americans rank either at the average or below the average in the five major subjects that are tested internationally compared to other rich countries like us. And as further bad news, this chart may be a little fuzzy, but the numbers are pretty clear. They show that there's been no material improvement in the international test scores uh, of American students at 15 years old. Now, fortunately, not all is bad news. There is some good news to report, which can get lost in a lot of the uh, hand-wringing about our K-12 educational system. So, for example, we can celebrate the fact that over the last 30 years, our dropout rate, not only on an average basis, but for kids of color and also of low income, the dropout rate has fallen. In addition, for those kids that graduate high school, we have a larger share of them going on at least to one year of college. So that's worth celebrating. But I don't want you to get too excited because the dropout rate may have fallen due to social promotion and there is one other disturbing fact about our educational performance. And that is that while the performance of low-income kids relative to their richer peers narrowed somewhat between 1980 and about 2008, it has quit narrowing since then. We've had no closing of those educational gaps. So I ask you, should we care about that fact? And I'm going to tell you the answer is yes for three reasons. First, these educational gaps, they betray our American ideal of equal opportunity. Second, they tear at our social fabric. 
Educational gaps today mean income gaps tomorrow. Now, for those of you, and I'm assuming all of you, who've been following the presidential race this year, you've heard much talk about income inequality and inequality of opportunity in life. Well, if you think, these thi if you think those things are bad now, imagine how much worse they will be if we don't start fixing the educational gaps that exist right now. And third, President Clinton, when he was in office, frequently said, you earn what you learn. And it was true, definitely true until the recession. But since the recession, which has basically experienced the slowest growth um, uh, of the uh, post-war uh, era, Many college kids, let alone high school uh, graduates or dropouts, many college kids have been unable to find jobs for which they have been trained. Many of them are living at home. And what they find they need to do is pivot in life, like many of you maybe. Go back to school, go back to community college, even go back to college or get another degree to find something that's marketable that will pay you a wage to put you on a ladder to success so that you can live the American dream. But you only have a chance of doing that successfully if you had a solid grounding in your K through 12 years. And so what we need is to improve the performance of our schools, especially for kids that are brought up in disadvantaged economic areas. So what can we do to change? Well, the obvious thing to do, uh, at least it would seem, based on economic research, is to get more good teachers in the classroom. Because what the research shows is that kids are more influenced by the quality of their teachers than almost anything else. So let's try to get more good teachers and try to remove the bad teachers. Easier said than done. Because union contracts often make it difficult in many cities and states to remove bad teachers from the classroom. In addition, Seniority-based pay, lockstep pay, in other words, that goes up with the number of years you're in school, can make it difficult for some local school districts to recruit really excellent teachers or to retain excellent teachers. So if we can't solve the problem that way, why don't we turn to performance-based pay? In other words, if you do a good job, you get paid more. This mechanism is used widely throughout the private sector why don't we use it more often in school? And in fact, we should. Washington, D.C. tried it, and they gave very large financial incentives for teachers that performed well, and very large financial sticks penalizing teachers that did not do well. And they found that, yes, performance-based pay can definitely, make a, uh, can definitely make a positive difference in the way kids perform in school. But some teachers don't like performance-based pay. They're worried that they'll get punished by a principal that may have a personal grudge against them. So my answer to that legitimate fear is to say, we need more school choice for teachers so that teachers are able to move to another school if they can't get along with their principal, just as those of you who are working in the private sector can leave and go to another employer. Schools should be no different. But not only should we have choice for teachers, we need choice for parents and their kids. There are some large cities like New York and Boston and Denver that allow parents and kids to choose among conventional public schools. And there are sophisticated economic algorithms that have been developed to actually figure out how to slot the people who are choosing schools with the available seats that are in these schools. One very famous economist, Alvin Roth, who won a Nobel Prize, has developed matching algorithms to do precisely this. And I strongly recommend this book that he's written called Who Gets What? Trust me, you don't have to be an economist to understand it. It's a fascinating example about how economics can definitely improve the average life of average citizens here in America. But what if there aren't enough good public schools in your area to choose from. Well, then what we need is more public charter schools. Charter schools are public schools, 
but they're not subject to the bureaucratic uh, discipline uh, or the bureaucratic nightmares that many public schools can be subject to. They allow principals more freedom to hire and fire their teachers. They allow teachers more flexibility in the classroom. And in fact, there are some terrific national networks of charter schools operating right now in the United States, and they serve primarily low-income kids. So that the Lolas and Sophias of the world that I talked about at the beginning, they can get a decent education. In fact, if you look at the performance of the KIPP kids, KIPP is actually a program or a set of schools, 180 of them actually throughout the country, that have been featured twice on 60 Minutes on CBS. KIPP's kids graduate at a higher rate than kids generally in the United States, despite the fact that the incomes of their families are lower than the average of other kids. So yes, we can educate poor kids, and in fact, we can do just as good a job for them as for the typical well, uh, or typical high income or medium high income kid who may be attending a, a school in the suburbs. The tragedy is, though, is that in too many areas in our country, there aren't enough good charter schools to meet the demand for them. So how do you think the slots in these schools then get allocated? The answer is by lottery. It's random. And imagine if you're a parent and you're trying to get your kid into a terrific charter school and you have to basically rely on a roll of dice to determine the fate of your children. Well, you can imagine in that circumstance that when it comes time to announce the results of these lotteries, the families that don't win get devastated. And this tragedy is depicted all too well in this movie, Waiting for Superman, which you can find on the web. It's a terrific documentary which, too, um, which, which sadly, in my view, describes a situation that is too, too common uh, throughout the United States. So what could we do to enable more charter schools to exist and give poor kids especially a chance to climb on that ladder of economic success toward the American dream? Three things. First, we need a change in many state laws that restrict charter schools, including the laws here in Kansas. And in fact, the Constitution here in Kansas has made it difficult to have charter schools in this state because all power for education is vested in a single state board of education, which has been hostile to charter schools. Second, we need more, we need more philanthropy. It takes philanthropic dollars to fund the capital cost or the leasing costs for these charter schools. And third, we need to equalize the funding formulas because charter schools are public schools, but on a per pupil basis in too many places in this country, the charter schools do not get the same amount of money as conventional public schools. If we did these things, we would have more slots so that we would provide more opportunity for more kids to realize the American dream, as I talked about. But you know, we don't need charter schools to replace all the public schools that now exist. Because research has shown, fortunately, that once you get a healthy market share of charter schools in a given area, the competition that charter schools provide to conventional schools can lift the performance of both of them. And that can be especially important in a place like Independence that may have a population of 10 or 15,000. Just one additional school can provide that effective additional competition to spur both the conventional and the, and the charter public schools to stay on their toes and provide a top flight education. Choice in K through 12 is not a radical idea. Just think about it. When you graduate high school, you have the choice among thousands of colleges or community colleges to attend. In your own private lives, forgetting school, you can go to the internet or you can go down the street, down here on Main Street on the, in Independence, and you have choices about what to buy and what services that you want to consume. But when it comes to education, 
why shouldn't we allow parents the ability to choose if they can, because that choice may be the most important decision that they can make that will affect the future of their kids. Unfortunately, there are opponents of charter school. They say there are some bad charter schools out there, so that if we let parents choose, they'll be worse off, the kids will be worse off. Now, it's true there are some bad, bad charter schools. I showed you before, though, that there are plenty of really terrific charter schools that, in fact, do a better job educating kids than our conventional schools. My answer to the critics of charter schools who say that we ought to not have charter choice simply because there are some examples of bad schools is to point to the private sector and ask the following question. Suppose you see a firm that produces some bad products. Does that mean we should therefore abandon capitalism? Of course not. In the school arena, we should rely on the forces of market discipline plus tough charter authorizers that should keep poor performing schools on their toes or put them out of business. So I want to return back to uh, Lola and Sophia. And I want you to imagine that you're their parents. And you don't have the income to move to a better neighborhood so that you can send those kids to a better school. And you don't have the income to send them to a private school either. And then, to make matters worse, you're told by the local school board or by the state board of education that your kids are not going to be able to benefit from, from the ability to choose among an excellent charter school. In other words, you're being told that no charter schools are going to be allowed in your neighborhood. Do you think you'd be mad? I know if I were Lola and Sophia's, uh, Sophia's parents, I'd be mad. And I suspect so would all of you. Now, I don't need to tell you in this political season that we are a very deeply divided country politically. But if there's one issue that we ought to have bipartisan consensus on, it's school choice. Because if you look around this country, you look at many cities and many states that have school choice, you'll see that they're governed by Democrats and Republicans. It makes no difference. And in fact, there's a lot more choice in a lot of places in this country than there is here in Kansas. And so it will not surprise you for me to conclude with this following thought. In my view, school choice for teachers, for parents, and their kids is the civil rights issue of our time because it advances the two factors or two principles that I know all of us widely share and that have helped make America unique, personal freedom and equal opportunity. Thank you very much.